Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to the York Festival Ideas. Welcome to the Yorkshire Museum. My name is Liam Herringshaw. Uh, I'm a paleontologist based here in York, uh, and I am director of the Yorkshire Fossil Festival. Um, just before we, we start this afternoon's talk, uh, make sure you have uh, familiarised yourselves with the, the screen. I have the official uh, guidance, which is that in the very unlikely event of an emergency, please follow the steward's instructions and evacuate the venue uh, via the closest available exit. Um, please, can I also ask you to uh, put your phones on silent, please? I've just checked that I've done that for mine. So I'm very pleased um, to, to have a speaker this afternoon uh, who, uh, as a paleontologist, is, is one of the, um, the, the names in paleontology. So Mike Benton is Professor a vertebrate paleontology at the University of Bristol um, and uh, has been uh, at the forefront of their, uh, their research for, for many years. His particular uh, research, well, his research expertise is extremely broad, but particularly three main areas, the, uh, the evolution of tetrapods, so things with, with four limbs, um, the, uh, the, the, the way in which mass extinctions uh, work or have worked, particularly the end Permian mass extinction at 252 million years ago, which was uh, the, the greatest of the mass extinction events to have hit the Earth. And in fact, Mike's book, When Life Nearly Died, is a, uh, an, an excellent uh, way to, to find out more about that event. Um, but his third uh, topic of particular interest is the, uh, uh, the exceptional uh, preservation of vertebrates in the Mesozoic, so that the, the era of life, which perhaps might be more generally called the age of reptiles. Appropriately here in York, uh, that was a, a word that was defined by John Phillips, who was the first keeper of geology here at the Yorkshire Museum. So Mesozoic is actually a York word uh, in, a, in a sense that, my, that John Phillips defined it as this middle life or the age of reptiles. And as Mike will uh, explain uh, in his talk, there are some extraordinary discovers, discoveries that have, um, have come out in the last uh, 20 years that have changed our understanding, revolutionized our understanding of perhaps the most famous of those Mesozoic reptiles, the dinosaurs. So Mike's book, uh, Dinosaurs, New Visions of a Lost World, uh, is, is the focus of his, his talk. Uh, he will be signing copies of the book afterwards, should you wish to get uh, a copy signed or buy a copy and get it signed. Um, and he will uh, uh, happily answer some questions after the talk. I will I'll chair that um, section. So think of any dinosaur questions you have to ask Mike. Um, but without further ado, I will introduce Mike to the talk. So Professor Mike Benton. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about three things in this talk, um, and these are indeed the subject of the book. Um, one of them is how much knowledge has changed in my field, paleontology, in the last 25 years, only 25 years. Secondly, the uh, uh, ability that we now have to tell the color of dinosaurs. That may sound a bit crazy or whatever. I will try and show you the evidence we have. And thirdly, that links to my third topic, which is how do we know about the past? And, and that can be encapsulated in a, in, a, in a phrase like, how would we know the color of dinosaurs if we don't have a time machine? And I'm going to show you how we do. And that broadens out into our ability to know a lot about the life of the past in a thoroughly scientific and testable manner, without a great deal of speculation. But let me take you back then 25 years to the meeting of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology in New York. This is a big uh, meeting of about 1,000 people. Essentially, all the dinosaur people in the world come to this meeting. In New York, it was buzzing with people, the American Museum of Natural History here on Central Park. Some of you may have been there. A wonderful venue. I was there as a relatively young whippersnapper, but I was aware that something strange was going on. There were a number of Chinese professors there, and that, that in itself was quite unusual. And they were wandering around showing photographs of fossils to people at the meeting. And at the same time, during the course of the meeting, this article appeared in the New York Times, which got it a very wide readership, the most serious, well-read paper in, in North America. 
And, and the title tells the story. And back in 1996, nobody had any idea that anything other than a bird would have feathers. The idea of saying, oh, dinosaurs have got feathers, would have, been, would have marked you as completely bonkers. And yet here he is, Malcolm Brown, a very respected science uh, journalist, writer, doing two extraordinary things. He's saying at this meeting, attended by all the best paleontologists in the world, people are discussing that dinosaurs maybe had feathers. And it's a specimen from China. Again, that was unusual at the time. China was still fairly closed at that point. It mentions Phil Curry, who is a very active uh, dino senior dinosaur researcher in Canada. And he was about the only person who really knew what was going on at that meeting, as I'll explain in a moment. So what was causing all the fuss? It was this specimen here, and uh, Professor Peiji Chen from a paleontological institute in Nanjing, that's the traditional second city of China. Um, he was showing this specimen around, uh, and I can't remember, I think he only had black and white photographs at the time, but nonetheless, the point he was asking people or putting to them was, this is a dinosaur, isn't it? It's not a bird. And then secondly, these structures all around the back of the head and, and sort of running down the middle of the back and then those sort of tufts along the tail. These are feathers, aren't they? So it, it, was a, it was a real puzzle because, of course, only birds have got feathers, but this isn't a bird. This is a dinosaur, and yet it seems to have feathers. So how do you explain it? Either it's a bird or it, these are not feathers. Those would be the two ways you could make sense of it. But he was not giving a paper, so it's quite unusual that in this news report, it wasn't based on a presentation, a formal presentation at the meeting. This was sort of whispers in corridors, if you like. The one thing that Phil Curry knew had happened at the same time as the meeting was that a different group of Chinese scientists, these, these ones based at the Geology Museum in Beijing, of course the capital of China, they had their specimen, a different specimen, shown here. Um, and they were determined to describe it as a bird. So they were interpreting these structures over the back of the head and on the back and on the tail as feathers, and they were saying it's a bird, even though it's got little, tiny little short arms, clearly couldn't fly, and they classify it, and, and this, this is the English translation of part of the paper. It was at the time published only in Chinese, so it was not accessible very widely to people outside China. They're definitely calling it a bird, Sinosauropteryx prima, meaning the first winged reptile from China, something like that. So what's going on? There are these two specimens doing the rounds at the same time, both of them in China, one of them getting some sort of international publicity, the other one not. And eventually, two years later, um, Chen and colleagues were able to publish their description in English, in Nature, talking about the Nanjing specimen. But they accepted it was the same as Sinosauropteryx prima that the Beijing people had been named. So what's going on? We have the Beijing specimen, which at the point, that point only Phil Curry outside um, uh, China had seen. We have the Nanjing specimen, two separate museums, big museums in separate cities. And who knows what they paid for these specimens? Probably thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. I've got no idea. Um, and nobody will ever admit. But look what you've got. These are two, they're not only members of the same species, they are the same specimen, aren't they? And so what often happens, if you've ever been geologizing on the beach at Whitby or somewhere like that, and you split open a, a, a rock and the, there's a beautiful ammonite inside, you've got the two halves. You can sort of look at the cast and the mold of the, the same specimen. And that's what we have here. So I'd love to know the full story, but I don't think we ever shall, that some smart fossil trader in China worked out what he could do, or she, and got a maximum price, and then both Beijing and Nanjing were so embarrassed afterwards they said nothing and made the best of it. It's not all like that. The point is that this, this was a real christening of, of the most extraordinary new discovery. It brought it to the global attention. It raised um, uh, uh, many debates, and this was only the first of an enormous flood of materials coming out of China in the past 25, 26 years. 
But let me, before I show you more of the Chinese stuff, let me just remind you of what we knew in the 1990s. And what we knew was not much different from what um, Thomas Henry Huxley knew back in the time of Darwin. And that was more or less all we had as a clue about the origin of birds was Archaeopteryx. And most people have heard of Archaeopteryx, very famous fossil. It's often called the missing link or some word like that. And it was of great interest to Charles Darwin because, in fact, th these specimens were first found in 1861 in Germany. And that's only two years after Darwin had published his On the Origin of Species, that very famous book. And in the book, he had chapters about fossils. And indeed, at that, in his time, there were many fossils were known but not as many as we know today. And he was very clear in his book. He said, we need to know more fossils. We must encourage collecting fossils because they will show us these intermediate connecting links between major groups. And Huxley, who was much more of a populist in a way, he labeled it immediately that this is a dinosaur in bird's clothing. And he was, he was absolutely right. But all we had, this is pretty much all that Huxley knew and this is pretty much all we knew by 1990, which was there's Archaeopteryx in the middle, dated at about 150 million years ago. Below it, we have dinosaurs, lots of different dinosaurs. And then above it, we have modern type birds. And there are fossils of modern type birds, maybe going back 70 or 75 million years. And just big gaps on each side. And, and so this is, this is why the, the Archaeopteryx specimens were so uh, intensely studied, because it was about all we had. And the specimens, as you saw a moment ago, um, are, are very beautiful, very detailed. The, every bone is there, and uh, even the feathers. So the feathers are not, they're mainly impressions, but there is some organic matter of those original feathers in, in the rock. So you could hardly ask for a more perfect fossil, if you like. And there are quite a few of them. There's about 15 specimens of Archaeopteryx known. Then China opened up. And um, this is what one of these fossil localities looks like. The map shows China and um, the uh, location of Liaoning province here. And Beijing, the capital, is here, this red dot here. Um, and the distance we, we drove there when we did field work is 500 miles from Beijing to Liaoning. So we must remember China is very, very huge. But the extraordinary thing is all over the north of China, uh, right over into Inner Mongolia here and all, with, all the way across here, several thousand kilometers, um, there, there are these kinds of sediments. So it covers an enormous area. And what we're looking at here is a photograph in um, Sihetun Quarry. You can see the scale of it. Here are a couple of geologists at the bottom. And what they've done is they've dug out um, the side of the quarry, and it consists of quite thin layers of muddy limestone. But there's, there's, you'll notice that they're sort of rusty looking. They've got iron oxide in them. And that comes from volcanic ash. So a lot of the sediment is not particularly ash falling directly into the lake, but it's being sort of mixed in and washed around. And it's something about the iron content and the acidity of the lake waters, these are ancient lake deposits, that allows exceptional preservation. And there are many, many sites like this, and so now thousands of specimens have been found. This one quarry has produced 1,000 spe specimens of Confucius ornithids, which are fossil birds, and almost all the specimens are of the same quality as the Archaeopteryx material. So the scale of availability of fossils just became suddenly enormous overnight. And it meant that paleontologists were not all fighting each other to get access to the limited number of Archaeopteryx specimens. Suddenly, there's all this rich amount of material. The, 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 the geological unit is often called the Jehol Group. Um, and, and that's just a regional name. And it covers almost all of these deposits across the north of China. And the list of fossils there, which I won't read through, are typical of lakes. They include um, fishes and other creatures that live in the lakes. And they include insects and um, birds and flying pterosaurs, which would be flying over the lakes and occasionally falling in. 
as well as a few things like mammals and dinosaurs that might be living around the edges of the lake. And there's obviously lots of plants and um, little shrimp-like things, and not mollusks and all sorts of other stuff. Let's get back to Sinoceropteryx then. This was the first feathered dinosaur ever reported. And um, it was recognized by Phil Curry when he saw the specimens in Beijing and again in New York that it's not a bird, it's a compsognathid theropod dinosaur. So it's very similar to Compsognathus, which is known from the same geological units in Germany as Archaeopteryx. Uh, maybe close to birds, but not, not a bird. Um, and here's a bit more detail of the so-called proto-feathers. So here's the, the vertebrae of the tail. And you can see on each side there are these sort of dark strips. And they are sort of tufts. There's a dark tuft there, and then a gap, and then a tuft, and a gap, and a tuft. So that seems to be fairly clear. And there are a number of specimens which all show that feature. But when that was the only feathered dinosaur that was known, quite reasonably, people were a bit skeptical. And so many said, no, no, it's clearly not a, a bird. These are probably not feathers. They may just be shredded skin. The counter was to say, well, why would the skin be shredded in such a regular fashion in, the, in forming these sort of tufts? But I think a couple of years later, when the second um, feathered dinosaur was named Chordipteryx, um, that was the end of the debate for most people. Because Chordipteryx had not only these whiskery kinds of little bristly feathers all over the body, and here's the fossil showing part of the um, wing, it also had more complex feathers. So there are all sorts of feathers, little whisker feathers, there's down feathers. If you've ever plucked a chicken or a pheasant, the fluffy feathers on, off, on the breast. But the majority of feathers along the wing or on the tail are what we call pennate feathers, meaning that they have a central um, uh, uh, quill and barbs sticking out of the sides. So the pennate feather is very complex. And if you've ever looked at a pigeon feather or, or, or a seagull feather close up, you can see the way that it's very carefully organized and the bits all fit neatly. And if you ruffle it through one way, it, it sort of unzips and ruffle it back the other way, it zips up to form a perfect structure. And Chordopteryx has these on the tail and on the wings. And these cannot be mistaken for shredded skin. The complexity of the structure shows that they really are feathers. And then a couple of years later, the third um, feathered dinosaur, Microraptor, which we'll come back to later. Um, again, you know, the fossils are often fantastically complete. Uh, there's the head, the, the, the neck, the, the, the long tail, the long bony tail. <clears throat> and you can see the forearm and the hind leg. And in fact, there are long pennate feathers. Look at the length of these primary feathers on the wings. And there are, there are hind wings as well. So this thing has got four wings in total. And we'll come back to what that means in a moment. But in terms of the feather story, this was beginning to tell people lots of dinosaurs had feathers. Although admittedly, these are all close to the origin of birds. I haven't shown you Confucius Ornis yet. I won't talk about it in any great detail. But before these feathered dinosaurs had been found, a variety of fossil birds had come out of the Jehol beds with feathers preserved, and Confucius Ornus being one of the unique, purely Chinese things. A lot of the dinosaurs, as I've mentioned, are very similar to dinosaurs we find elsewhere. And look at this. There is no Archaeopteryx with two specimens on the one slab. This is probably a male and a female, the, the male with long banner feathers on his tail. <clears throat> but what was, the, what was the importance of all of this? Remember that diagram of dinosaurs, and then a long gap, Archaeopteryx, and then a long gap, and modern birds. This is now what we can show. I'll show you a few diagrams of evolution. We've filled a lot of the gaps. So the, the Chinese fossils, there are now dozens of species. I think there are now 50 species of feathered dinosaurs, and about 50 species of fossil birds have been reported up to date. And when you plot them in an evolutionary tree, you're filling up a lot of the gaps. And it's not just simply that. It's, it's what we learn about the important features. The reason we're interested in the origin of birds is that birds are so successful. Uh, and we know why they are, because they can fly. And the ability to fly involves an enormous array of special characters. 
And Archaeopteryx had most of those features in terms of the structure of the wing, the way it could fold up, the structure of the hips and hind limbs for landing, um, the sensory systems and the brain and the hollow bones, all the sort of features that make a bird a bird. Archaeopteryx had them. But thanks to these fossils, we now, we now know that nearly all of these 30 uniquely avian features emerged before Archaeopteryx. And that's a much more expectable kind of Darwinian evolution, rather than a kind of almost miraculous idea that Archaeopteryx suddenly springs up with all these 30 special features, enabling it to fly like a modern bird. In fact, most of them had emerged much earlier, and it was something like 50 million years of acquisition of bird-like features. Including, for example, this allows us then to look at things like the evolution of the wing, step by step. And if, if you want to understand why birds are so great at flying and what the intermediate steps were and could they fly or not and, and all that sort of thing, then you need to be able to look at these features in detail. And of course, to understand the bird wing, the bones are not enough on their own. You need to have the feathers. So we're very fortunate that these are exceptional fossils. It shows us another thing. Here's a different take on the evolutionary tree. This is Triassic down here, Jurassic is somewhere in about here, and then Cretaceous at the top. And this is the origin of dinosaurs down here, and the origin of birds is over about here, and these are all birds up on the right-hand side. And what's going on here is that in the line to birds, not in the lines to other groups, this, this is T-Rex, these are other giant flesh-eating dinosaurs, um, but in this line to birds, there's 50 million years of miniaturization they're getting smaller and smaller. Because, of course, if you're evolving flight, you can either do it by sprouting enormous wings to try and support your body mass, or get smaller, because then the size of the wings in proportion is much less. And it seems to have been a, a coupled pattern of evolution going on, and now we have this richness of data that lets us understand that. And, yet more unexpectedly, um, powered flight originated multiple times. The assumption had been, up until the discovery of all these fossils, really up until a couple of years ago, that probably only Archaeopteryx could fly of the various Jurassic beasts that we've been looking at. But it turns out now that the threshold from, from gliding to flight, I'll explain those terms in a second, the threshold from gliding to true powered flight um, was crossed maybe four or five times. And this can be calculated for the fossils by a fairly simple relationship that we know, it's a basic principle of aerodynamics, which applies to birds and bats and insects and aeroplanes, that the area of the wing has to be sufficient to lift the body mass, to, to hold the body mass aloft. And so there is a simple ratio between the um, area of the wing in square centimeters or square millimeters versus the body mass in the body mass in grams or kilograms. How do we know the body mass of these fossils? Well, we don't for sure. But if you have a skeleton of something like Archaeopteryx, which when you render it in three dimensions, it's very much like a pigeon skeleton in overall size, then it's not unreasonable to say probably it had the same sort of weight as a pigeon plus or minus 20 or 30 percent. And so that that's what was done here by Pei and colleagues, and so they did this, and they discovered to their amazement that actually the threshold to powered flight was crossed several times. And once was by birds, of course, down here. A second one was by, um, uh, uh, let me see where it is, somewhere in here, yeah, Microraptor. And here's another drawing of Microraptor. So if it only had had the arm wings, that would not have been enough to get it flapping and off the ground. But it also has those hind wings, and then that gives it the area needed. So, um, uh, biologists use the term flight or flying usually to mean any kind of aerial transport. Whether you're a spider just flying through the air on a, on a piece of silk, or an insect flapping away like mad to keep in the air, or, or a gliding snake which just spreads its ribs and can extend its, its, its jump. 
uh, or, or a frog which has, you know, there's certain frogs that have got big feet and they have webs between the feet. So there's all kinds of flying animals today. But in common parlance, we normally mean a flight powered flight, and that's a different thing because gliding is just extending your jump. So the point here is that flight, powered flight, was achieved multiple times. And we know that also, here's another one, E. Chi, this is, if you, if, this is pub quiz information, the, the dinosaur with the shortest name. I don't think you can make a shorter name than that. It's got to have two words like Homo sapiens, the genus and the species, so E. Chi. And so here it is, and it has feathers and it also has membranes. So it's got the weirdest of wings and it's doing it as well. So this is all the sort of new richness of information that we've got from these fossils. Let me get to the color thing. So we published this paper in 2010, and we were fairly bold in the title. Uh, the key thing I want you to notice is the word melanosome. This is the key that I'll be talking about. And in this paper, which is a combination of um, Chinese researchers from Beijing and a bunch of us from Bristol, we were using a new method uh, uh, that, that enables you to tell the color of fossil feathers. How do we do it? And, you, and, and it, of course, needless to say, some of you may remember, it, it, but, but it raised a great deal of interest at the time and widely reported, this is our dinosaur up here. Indeed, we were studying Sinoceroptrix with its barred tail. And a different group at Yale University were studying a different dinosaur, Anchiornis, and, and it has the most amazing colored crest and, and, and stripes on its wing feathers, et cetera, et cetera. So we were both independently working on the, the same question. We succeeded in publishing a week or two before then, but that doesn't, ma that doesn't matter. It, it, this is unusual in paleontology. This is not like racing to discover the cure for coronavirus or something like that. But what, what are we saying? This is really important, I think. We're, we're, not, we're saying very clearly for example, that this reconstruction at the top is wrong, whereas this one is correct. And, and we're, not, we're not saying this is because this is simply our opinion, and we don't like Professor X who prefers that color, and you'd better believe us because this is what we say. It's because we actually have evidence, so let me show you. It comes from these structures called melanosomes. So two things you need to know. Feathers are made of the protein keratin, with a K, and keratin also is the protein that makes our hair and our fingernails. And so if you look at your fingernails, this is the sort of native type of keratin. It's naturally transparent, there's no color. Any color you see is just the color of your skin shining through. And uh, it is sort of plastic, you can kind of bend it and, and, and so on, and hair and feathers are the same. If you think of, if you've handled a bird feather, it's the same stuff. And generally, color can get into the keratin, but, but with difficulty. And so the way the color is inserted is it's included in small capsules or, or little cavities within that structure. And these are the melanosomes. And the word melanosome is based on the pigment melanin. So the other thing you need to know is the pigment melanin, which I think most people have heard of, is, is in our skin, it's in many parts of our body, it forms the retina of the eye, that black reflecting structure at the back of your eye, um, and it's also in your brain and, and in your liver and all, many, many organs of the body, present in all animals, present in plants, in fungi. So melanin is a very uh, common biological molecule. The, the normal sort of melanin, eumelanin, gives these black, brown, and gray colors. Whereas there is another kind of melanin that is found in hair and feathers called pheomelanin, which gives ginger colors. So if anybody has ginger hair, naturally, you've got pheomelanin in your melanosomes. Um, whereas if you have the more common colors of blacks and grays and browns and, and blondes, then you have different amounts of eumelanin. And the, the, the intensity of shade, more or less, depends on the packing of those color capsules. So paler colors have got looser packing, intense black, intense ginger, tight packing of the melanosomes. And this is what they look like. So we took a feather from a zebra finch, and even a single feather will have all the different, the palette of colors. So you have the pheomelanin part colored gingery here. The, the white windows on this are, 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 I guess this is from in here actually, 
The white windows lack melanin. They're just transparent, in fact. And then the dark color, the black, is from eumelanin. And it just so happens that the shapes of these melanosomes are different. And this is the clue. This is the key. So the, the common ones, uh, uh, the eumelanosomes are sausage-shaped, and the pheomelanosomes are spherical. And this scale bar is one micron, which is about one millionth of a meter. And we could only see them by, by looking at these under the scanning electron microscope and turning up the magnification to pretty much the maximum possible. And they had been seen before, but not commonly, and people had in, misinterpreted them in the past. So here we have the whole story. When we took samples from specimens of Sinoceroptrix uh, all over the body, from the tail, from the back, and different parts of the body, we then looked at them under the scanning electron microscope. This is what we saw, so this is fossil material. <coughs> and what you're seeing there are uh, all spherical structures, no signs of a any sausage-shaped structure, and the spheres are either solid or moldic. So remember, these things are kind of impressed into the plastic type of structure of the keratin, and so a lot of, in a lot of cases, because with a fossil, you just sort of break it to, to have a look, they've sort of fallen out um, because they shrink slightly with preservation. Remember, these are 120 million years old, so it's amazing we see anything. They've shrunk, and they tend to fall out. Anyway, and so that's what gives us the reconstruction. And why, do we, why are we sure about the white and the ginger? The fact is, in the, the white zone, there are no melanosomes of any sort. They are feathers, but they are colorless, just the standard uh, colorless tone. So that, that is what we call a chain of inference. Each of the steps can be uh, rejected by evidence. And so this makes it science, because it can be rejected. Not by somebody saying, I don't like it. That's not a way to reject a scientific hypothesis. You actually have to say, I have got evidence against it. And that could be found. So anybody could come along and say, well, you just got this result because of your particular specimen, so we're going to look at a different specimen. Or they could say, you did some fancy dealing when you looked at the thing under the microscope. We don't know what you did. You were mucking about with it. You faked it up somehow. So they can look at the specimens under their scanning electron microscope independently. Um, and the, the third point that could be rejected is this observation of the constancy of, of color and shape. And so the, the relationship between color and shape has been found in every example of modern bird feather that people have looked at and in every example of mammal hair that people have looked at as well. So you can take human hairs and if you, if, depending on your hair color, you should find these two different uh, 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 relationships. So that's how we know the color of dinosaurs. And I would say it's, we've survived for 12 years. It's not yet been refuted. It might be any time, of course. But, and the only way it can be refuted or rejected is based upon evidence. And I've mentioned what those pieces of evidence could be. Here we come to the first of the new artworks. So one of the features of um, the book is that Bob Nichols, who's a very famous and very skillful paleo artist um, who lives in Bristol, works in Bristol, um, he has done a sequence of wonderful illustrations for the book um, showing every detail of the appearance of these creatures in life. And we're arguing that we've chosen examples where we can demonstrate evidence for all the features that we show. And so in the case of Sinoceroptrix, we've already done the color thing on the tail and the body. After our work, other people looked and did further work, and they, they were able to highlight that the, the animal had very definite counter shading, which means it's got dark color on top and pale color underneath. This is quite commonly seen in animals as a kind of, kind of camouflage. And also, it was noticed that it's got a so-called bandit mask so that over the eyes, it's like one of those cartoon bandits. It's got a sort of strip of dark color. For what reason, nobody can say. But that's, that's what the fossil shows. And also, the other feature of this is that we're showing um, the simple bristly feathers. And, and again, they are, they are preserved in the fossils. So that's a key feature of the book, um, that we're, we're, we're saying this is the first time that anybody has presented the image of the past with this level of detailed exploration of everything you see in front of you. 
and therefore what you see, we think, is, is much more defensible, much more true to uh, reality than, than almost any other dinosaur book beforehand. Let me give you another example just to bear that out. A very different kind of dinosaur. This is Cetacosaurus, also from China, from the same age of rocks as um, Sinosauropteryx. And it's a plant-eating dinosaur. Sinosauropteryx was a meat-eater. And in this painting by uh, Bob Nichols, um, he's showing an adult with a number of babies. So what's the evidence for that? First of all, the clutch clusters, clutches of babies. There are many, many specimens like this have been found in a particular locality in China called Lujia Tun, a village. Um, and they are preserved differently than most of the fossils because they are in three dimensions. They're not in the fine-grained lake deposits. In fact, they are preserved in volcanic ash. And this locality is sometimes called the Chinese Pompeii. Because just like the eruption of Pompeii in AD 79, um, it's not humans here, it's dinosaurs. They were probably running away from the volcanic eruption. The ash was falling, the hot ash was falling from the sky. And of course, very quickly, they would be killed and then covered. And as at Pompeii, all of the flesh and soft tissues are burnt off. So you don't find any of the feathers or skin or other structures. But we do find these quite common examples of clusters of six or eight babies, generally all pointing in the same direction, generally all the same size, the same age. And so it's very tempting to, to, to give a story that, of course, there they were in some little group, unsupervised and running like uh, babies at a kindergarten or something like that. At first, people thought these were fakes because they're, they're just, it's just such an evocative idea. But there are hundreds and hundreds of examples like this in museums in China. And this is one that my student, um, Zhao Qi, studied. I don't think his name is there. And he, he sectioned and looked at the bones. And you can tell the age of the dinosaurs from growth rings. They're all two years old, except for the pink one, number whatever that is, number one. It's three years old. So that's big brother or big sister looking after the babies and they're all sticking together. We don't, know, we don't know any more than that, but there are plenty of clusters of babies. And this is the specimen that gave the color. This is a fairly unique example because it's not often that you find a whole dinosaur in those lake beds. It's mainly, and, and a biggish, well, not big, not huge. This is about two and a half meters in length. But it's big enough, and it's quite unusual to find such a thing in the lake beds. But because it is in those lake beds with the acidic water, the ash mixed in, that helps to somehow preserve the skin. And this extraordinary one is in the Senckenberg Museum in, in Frankfurt in Germany. And you can imagine when they got it, why it was so celebrated. Because you've got a complete skeleton. There's the tail and, and the rib cage and, and the head and, and the arm and the leg. Because the whole thing is surrounded by dark material, and, and this is, it looks like, it is what it looks like. This is the skin. So you've got the, the whole thing, the dinosaur skeleton, wrapped up in its skin. And the skin is not impressions. This is real organic material. And you can even see the different colors, the pale color behind the legs. Maybe you can make out some sort of speckling there, a bit of speckling here in, in the shoulder, and dark colors over the back. And, and maybe you can see on, on the tail, there are these weird structures that look like reeds or, or, or pieces of coarse grass. So these are the scientific reconstructions that Bob Nichols did when that specimen was described by uh, Jakob Winter and colleagues. And, and Jakob Winter was the one who led the, he was the one who first had the idea about color um, and led the rival group at Yale University. So we employed him in Bristol, so we have no reason to fight anymore. And this, these were his reconstructions. So I'm going to flip-flop and particularly maybe look at this one here. Notice the dark color over the face and the horns, the, the, the speckle of color over the um, shoulder region and behind the legs and the pale color under the, the body, and these weird structures standing up on the back. Um, and again here. So if I just go back, there's the fossil. Look at, particularly look around the shoulder area, the, the back of the legs. And then, so every detail that Nichols has shown, working with Winter and colleagues, is, is based on the fossil. So we would then claim 
that this reconstruction is based on a great deal of evidence and that this is truly what it looked like and that whether the parent would take the babies around or not is, 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 is a matter of conjecture. But the, the colors and the, these weird structures which are, which are in themselves a strange kind of feather, they're made of keratin, they are some sort of a feather, are, are clearly there, but for what purpose, we've got no idea. The third story I'm going to tell you is about a pterosaur. Um, so it's not just dinosaurs where this works. There are other creatures living in the Mesozoic, and, and these include the pterosaurs, the flying reptiles, which are not dinosaurs, but they're cousins of dinosaurs. And in 2019, um, we were working with another group in China, and um, we'd been doing field work in Inner Mongolia, in the north of China, looking for uh, fossils like this. We found some. I was there. It was the most extraordinary experience. And we had a couple of specimens which, were, which preserved um, the skin and the structures very beautifully. And there had been some debate about what is it that is covering the pterosaurs. They, they had, it's been known for a long time, they had some sort of fluffy covering. And um, they were called, pick, these, these um, bristles were called pycnofibers in pterosaurs. And people had just left it at that. They didn't know what they were quite, but they assumed they were for main, mainly for insulation. A purpose of having fluffy feathers all over the body is for insulation. If you're warm-blooded in some way, like a bird or a mammal, that's a great way to keep in the warmth and allow your body to keep a constant temperature. So it was sort of assumed, and if these things are flyers, which they obviously are, they need to burn through a lot of energy just to fly. It's a very energetic pursuit, being a, an active flying creature. You've got to eat plenty, you've got to have that sort of inner furnace that keeps you going. So all of that was, was reasonably well accepted. But we looked closely at these pycnofibers, and we were pretty convinced in this 2019 paper that these are actually feathers. So this is, this is, this is taking that shocking uh, uh, observation in 1996 even further. It's not only that lots of dinosaurs had feathers, but also we're saying also the pterosaurs. They're not dinosaurs, they're cousins of dinosaurs. But this means that feathers must have originated much, much earlier than people had thought. What's our evidence? It was because we were looking at these structures and we noticed that lots of them were simple bristles, like this one, which is what we expected. But then we found some of them had tufts at the end or tufts halfway down, or they branched from the base. And in fact, all of those four structures ha have been identified in different dinosaurs where they're, people happily call them feathers. And we looked at the structure of these. They're made of keratin. They contain melanosomes, rendering the color. We can tell the color of the pterosaurs. So we, we just said, yeah, they're feathers. Um, we, we, we couldn't quite make that the title. This, this is a, a, a serious scientific journal, so we had to say feather-like branching, so we're not overstating the case. But we're pretty much saying these are feathers. This is Bob's reconstruction of that creature. And um, this particular group of pterosaurs are unusual in having a very broad mouth, so it's impossible to make one of them look unhappy. Um, they, they always look as if they're smiling. And this one, because he's spotted a very nice, tasty lace wing that he's about to eat. This is quite a small creature, about the size of a, a, a pigeon or, or something of that size, magpie, something of that size. Here's an even, here's a weirder pterosaur. This, this one is from Brazil, so I want to show you finally two examples not from China. This one is from the same age in, in the mid-Cretaceous of Brazil, about 120 million years ago. But this is one of the really weird and crazy pterosaurs, which would have had a wingspan of about five meters. So that's huge, that's, that's halfway the width of this theater. And um, it's got that amazing head which is almost as big as the body. So this is the head. The eye socket is here, so there's the neck. So there's the eye socket, it's got this crazy long strut at the back. And then the mouth is here, there's the lower jaw and the hinge of the jaw is here. And no teeth. And then this huge hole is just a, a sort of weight saving device. And then it's got this ridiculous thing on its nose going all the way back. And so here's the fossil. And so, and this is a, a, a cast, a sort of museum uh, demonstration, 3D model. 
And so the whole function of the head and all of that is utterly weird and mystifying. But when you look at the fossil, the, this structure between the struts it, 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 it is, is, is membrane, is skin. So what it's doing is this is like a, a sailing yacht, and these are the, spr the, 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 the spars that are supporting the sail. And this skin would have been thick enough not to tear, but relatively lightweight. And most of the skull is made of hollow bones, so the whole thing is actually quite lightweight. But why on earth have such a structure? And the thought is, just like with um, those dinosaurs, um, with all those stripes and color patterns and crests and such like, as well as um, this structure here, it seems to me these are all for signaling in some way or another. And you've all seen the films by David Attenborough talking about lyre birds and all these amazing birds where the males have crazy, crazy feathers which they jump around and flash and rustle and uh, uh, seek to attract the females by that means. It's pretty certain that these dinosaurs and these pterosaurs were doing just the same thing because the hair or the feathers can have maybe three functions. One is insulation, that's probably the first function. Second is signaling, which we didn't know about, of course, until we could determine the colors. And now that seems to be quite widespread. And so on the, the, within the skin here, melanosomes occur. And they indicate that in different species of Tupandactylus and its close relatives, there are different spotty patterns, which almost certainly, again, are something to do with signaling. And the size of that head shield, the size of that structure, can have no other function. People have done experiments to determine does it improve their aerodynamics or anything? No. If anything, it's an impediment. Better not to have it, really. Um, so all of this and the possibility of flashing them seems to be what's going on. And here's Bob Nichols's reconstruction. So the final example is a dinosaur, and this one is from Canada. <coughs> and in this case, uh, again, we're talking about keratin. We're talking about armor. It's a different kind of case from the previous ones. The Athabasca tar sands are what the name says. I, I, I like geology because a lot of the terminology is very extremely obvious. Located at Athabasca, what are the rocks? They're sand. What do you find in them? Tar. So that's, they're called the Athabasca tar sand. And I think now they're feeling distinctly unpopular, but in, in their day before people worried about carbon uh, uh, excess use and so on. This was such a cheap source of, of um, uh, petroleum. It was at the surface. And here and there, occasionally dinosaurs are found in this. And here is one example. This one was found um, 15 or so, 10 or 15 years ago. And it's, a, it's an ankylosaur. It was called Borealopelta, meaning something like nor northern armor, because it's from sort of far north of, of Canada. Um, it's very big. Here's, here's a, a person here. And, and what you're looking at is the head, the quite heavily armored head is here, spiky plates and rings around the neck, and something going on here over the shoulder, and then a sort of armor over the back, some of which shows a kind of pinkish color, which I'll come back to. And here are the, the drawings. This thing was published in 2017, and they were able to map out the different kinds of armor plates. So you can see it's a very comprehensive armor covering the body, different shaped plates in different regions. Over the neck are these uh, spiky plates, some of which are quite long, very definitely um, offensive as well as defensive. And then the rest of it are largish bony plates in the skin separated by areas of tiny plates. So it's like a kind of chain mail that would have been slightly flexible in life so that the animal could move. And this is a herbivore, it's very big. Um, and the defense is, rather than running, it just hunkers down, probably, when, when it's attacked. Um, and so in its reconstruction, when you look at this, you can see all of these features that we saw in the fossil. The head is completely overgrown with extra bone to protect it. The only uh, unarmored parts, really, are underneath the body, the legs and, and the underbelly. So presumably, when threatened, it somehow draws itself down. But don't think tortoise, you know, don't think that, something that would sit on your hand. This thing, think more Sherman tank. This is more what you're looking at. And, and the, the key thing is over the um, neck area are these really quite sharp spikes. And these ones, just to give you the size, the long ones are about a meter in length. So if Boudicca thought she had 
invented something special with those swords on her, the wheels of her chariots. Well, nature had come upon it a uh, hundred million years earlier. And, and so this thing clearly was a bit of a terror or a bit of a, an impossible nut to crack for the predators of the day. Um, but the important point about the, 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 the covering of the bony plates was keratin, and it bore a, a, a pheomelanin gingery color. And so this thing is all over a sort of sandy, gingery sort of color, which seems very weird. I don't know why, but it just is. Hence, we were able to show it as such. And in this case, the keratin is taking on a certain color that maybe was some kind of camouflage. I don't know. So I want to wrap up with a couple of points about evidence and how we do things. Um, I've talked about the enormous amount of knowledge that we've got from China and from other exceptional fossils around the world and that a lot of this has happened um, really quite fast, quite recently, literally the last 25 years. Um, secondly, I've given the example of how we could reconstruct the color of dinosaurs, which people up to a point said this can never be done. And I didn't realize at the time that in the philosophy literature there'd been a long-running debate about how do you do historical science. And more or less one side was saying it can't be done, it's all guesswork. And of course, that's a pity because that means that the whole of geology, paleontology, even archaeology are sort of thrown into the totally non scientific, total guesswork area. And chemistry and physics and so on are over here as, as proper sciences. And, and it had been said, we'll never know the color of dinosaurs as one of their type examples in the philosophical arguments. So, and then they noticed, ooh, actually, we, we can. Um, and so I want to draw, draw that together a little bit, and my other book, which is on sale here, called um, Dinosaurs Rediscovered, which I wrote a few years ago, a little paper back there, it's really trying to go through the, the science in a big way, not just the color, but it's also looking at these other themes. And I suppose the principles we have are, if, you in, if you're going to interpret the past, use the, the, the laws of nature that apply today, and assume, unless there is contrary evidence, that they also apply in the past. Therefore, you can probably reject ideas that involve something like, let's assume that gravity was lower in the Jurassic than it is today. You say, hold on, have you got any evidence for that? Because if you're just saying, oh, well, to make this theory work, like giant dinosaurs, how could they walk? Oh, well, probably gravity was less. That's not good, because that's just making stuff up. Whereas we would just say, and we say, no, of course, gravity in the Jurassic was almost certainly the same as it is today. And the laws of physics would be the same. And so here's one example where a number of years ago, um, the professor of biomechanics at the University of Leeds, I should put his name on here, actually, uh, McNeil Alexander, came up with this observation that you can calculate the speed of any running animal knowing gravity, stride length, and hip height. So, he had noted that the faster you move, the longer your stride. So if you're walking slowly, your stride length is quite short. But if you start running, the stride length can get three or four times as long. And in fact, there is a standard relationship for any individual person or animal between stride length and speed. So all we need to know are stride length. You can measure that from the fossil tracks. So here are some dinosaur trackways, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, going up there, and there's another one coming across here. So you can measure the stride length directly. Um, you've got gravity, because you're saying gravity in the Jurassic is the same as it is today. And hip height, you need to know which dinosaur made the track. And normally we do. And, and you've got great examples on the Yorkshire coast, of course, which some of you will have seen around Scarborough, of Jurassic trackways. And we have a pretty I good idea who made each track. Um, and, that, that, and why do we believe it? because it always works in the present day. Whether the animal is bipedal, like us, or like birds, walking on two legs, or walking on four legs, like a dog or a cat or, or, or a lizard, it always works. And so if it always works, it always works, it always works, it'll work in the past. And this gives us a speed for T-Rex of 27 kilometers per hour. And a second thing that we can do is sometimes, rarely, sometimes you can use a second line of investigation to corroborate the, 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 the measurement, or you hope it will corroborate. So the first principle I said was stick with the modern rules. We call that technically uniformitarianism. 
And secondly, corroboration. Is there a second way of looking at it? In this case, John Hutchinson at the Royal Veterinary College, he had the smart idea that there is another relationship that we can tell from the skeleton, and that is that um, speed, the maximum speed that an animal can achieve, or a human, is represented or proportional to the, 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 the diameter of the, the main running muscles in the leg. And so if you've seen a sprinter, they have enormously muscular thighs. And you could probably tell who, who's going to run fastest if you could just measure the diameters of their legs and save them the bother of running. Um, and in fact, that relationship of, of leg muscle diameter to speed is more or less what's shown here. And his thought experiment was, what if we could uh, imagine a uh, scaled-up chicken? A typical chicken weighs about half a kilogram and can run very fast. And if your only knowledge of chickens is in Tesco's, you might find that hard to believe. But if you try to catch an actual chicken, I don't know how many have, they actually are very fast. But if you scale it up to six tons, and he knew the answer, it, it, it couldn't run anything like that. Because as it gets bigger and bigger, it, it has to, the this volume of those leg muscles has to become even larger in proportion to body mass, not in proportion to area. And that means they become impossibly huge. In other words, it could just never run fast. And T-Rex is indeed the six-ton chicken because it's related to chicken. And it's six tons. And so it could not run. And the maximum speed would be about 27 kilometers per hour. So here's a second example where we use uniformitarianism and corroboration. Biting. Um, so a question is, what would the bite force of T-Rex be? And the first approach was actually done a number of years ago using this specimen here. And this is a bit of triceratops bone, um, and it's got a, a deep gash here. And this coin is an American cent. That's about one centimeter. And so the first thing the investigators did was to push some putty or moldable plastic into that hole and then pull it out. And what they had was the tip of a T-Rex tooth. It's quite a recognizable shape. So they'd identified who had done the biting. And then they just did simple physical experiments in the laboratory with a sort of force plate and with a piece of modern cow bone and just driving a, a, a model tooth into the bone. And what force was needed to drive that model tooth, whatever it was, three or four centimeters, into the bone. And I think the force was about 12 or 15,000 newtons. So that was one experiment that showed that the bite force of T-Rex was considerably greater than that of the great white shark. Here, here's its value. But we don't know whether that was its maximum bite force. That was what was done on that day when it bit that piece of bone. Probably not its maximum. So and, uh, Bates and Falkingham at, at the University of Liverpool, they did some calculations on a um, 3D digital model in the computer using standard uh, physics engineering software and here is the T-Rex skull. The, the muscles are shown as these red sort of rubber bands inside. And the bits of food are these, these yellow things. And, and the hinge point is this blue thing. And so they were able to do various calculations, assuming a knowledge of the, the nature of the bone and so on. And they came out with a great range of estimates. But look at the range here, even though we don't know exactly what that might mean. It's much, much more than any living animal. Um, and, and humans are a very weedy little 200 to 700 newtons. And I think, I, I can never remember this, I think uh, 10,000 newtons is about a ton of force, or is it two tons or half a ton? But in any case, what we're looking at here for the T-Rex at maximum bite is a force equivalent to five tons. So if your question was, could it bite a car in half, the answer is yes. If, if it had been presented with a car, it could have bitten it in half. And it's a much, and we can, so do we believe these calculations? I think a good reason that we should is, has been presented by Professor Emily, Emily Rayfield, a colleague of mine in Bristol. And she had the dream PhD a number of years ago, which was to work out the bite force of T-Rex. And so she starts with the skull at the top, you scan it into the computer, you have your 3D model, there's no point doing this kind of study using um, solid model making techniques because you can't make it out of bone. You'd be making your T-Rex model out of plaster or plastic or metal or something. And that's entirely pointless because of course those have different physical properties to bone. The great power of the computer technique is that you give it the physical properties of bone. 
And the way that is done is you, you then divide it up into a three-dimensional mesh, like in the second figure, and to each of those pyramids in the structure, you give them physical properties of how much they can bend before they break and how much compression they can take before they give way. And then having coded up the whole thing, she was able to apply forces at different points to test whether it could twist and pull or whether it could bite on one side, on the other side, what the forces were. And why do we believe it? Well, finite element analysis is used by engineers and has been for 50 or more years in designing um, buildings, bridges, aircraft. And so before they go into manufacture, they use this approach of building the model, mapping the cells, the material property. It allows you, once, for example, you've got your model of the aircraft, you can test it with different material properties. Should we make the aircraft out of steel, aluminium, plastic and steel? You can sort of work out all. So it's got an immense power for manufacturing. So if you've ever been in an aeroplane or gone across a modern bridge or gone to the top floor of a high-rise building, you believe that this method works. And if it works for engineering, it works for dinosaurs too. Anyway, so that was the message from my earlier book as well. So I, th I hope in the, in the last 40 minutes or so I've uh, uh, brought you up to date a little bit on dinosaurs. There's a lot more known than was a few years ago, thanks mainly to Chinese fossils, but partly to new technology. And that connects then with the other two themes, number one being, yes, we do know the d colors of many dinosaurs, not all dinosaurs. Uh, and secondly, or thirdly, that's part of that broader um, push to make our understanding of what they could do as scientific as we can by using rigorous approaches and coming up with uh, facts that we believe are, are pretty solid and will take a bit of beating, they'll take a bit of criticism because we've got the evidence to present them. So thank you very much for your attention and happy to answer any questions now. last 20 or so years have been uh, just seeming an endless number of new discoveries, both of new specimens but also of new ways of thinking. So I think there's often this idea that we know, you know a lot about dinosaurs. As Mike's shown, there's still plenty uh, to work on and probably plenty of good questions. Now, I'm conscious that doing uh, school classes, the questions I can never answer are asked of me about dinosaurs by young people. Uh, so if there are any young people here who want to ask a question of, uh, of Mike, and put him on the spot, because he knows a lot more about dinosaurs than I do, then if any of you do have a question you'd like Mike to answer, wave at me, uh, and we have a... You've got a microphone roving. So let me just see. If there are any, any, any particularly... Any, anyone... School children, anyone feeling... I've got, I've got a hand over here. Do you want to... I've got a microphone there, super. So let's uh, <laughs> put Mike on the spot. Yeah, yeah. What's your question? What's the biggest meat-eating dinosaur? Oh, what is the biggest meat-eating meat dinosaur? That's a very good question. I don't know the answer. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> means, yes. it, it depends <laughs> on what you mean by biggest. Um, if you mean longest, it's maybe Spinosaurus. If you mean height, I don't know. People have only generally done it in length. So the, the contenders are Tyrannosaurus rex, um, Spinosaurus, Carcharodontosaurus, and maybe... I'm trying to think of uh, Giganotosaurus, the South American one. So those four, all of them belong to different groups. And I think, you know, I think T Rex is the heaviest. I don't know who's the tallest, though. Maybe T Rex as well. Thank you. Right, so I can see a question at the front. You want to bring a. <laughs> get you running around the room. <laughs> Thank you very much. I found that a really fascinating Thank lecture. It, it's one of my pet subjects. I've been interested in since I was a kid. And uh, um, I knew all about archaeopteryx, you see. And uh, the birds... Um, uh, oh, I presume... That, do they, I was going to ask you the question. Do they descend from archaeopteryx? Or are they, could they descend from another dinosaur, the birds? So, uh, well, the, the archaeopteryx was the yeah. true bird. Um, is that the first bird, basically? Yes, so I think it, it's... it's um, it, it, now there's a lot of creatures around Archaeopteryx in the evolutionary tree. It used to be very much on its own. 
I think by convention, people would still say Archaeopteryx is the first bird. But that is a convention because, of course, the, the evolutionary tree is quite complicated and you can point at different points along that. With, you know, dinosaurs down here, birds up here. Where do you draw the line? And it used to be easy because there was such a long gap on each side. But now it's all been filled up. So there are a bunch of these Chinese things, in fact, like Anchiornis, which are actually very close to Archaeopteryx, but just below it. So I think conventionally, for, for sort of historical reasons, we normally would say Archaeopteryx is still the first bird. I'll, I'll pass on, but during the 70s, uh, the, there was a, the, um, the Hamlin books were very good. I don't remember the Hamlin books. They were very, very good on dinosaurs. Sorry, two, the which books? Uh, it's got to call the Hamlin books. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. yeah thank you. Right, we have a, I can see a hand over here, if you want to come across. I'm conscious that we'd be at the back. Oh, we'll find out. Yeah, it does work. It's fine. <laughs> um, I realise I'm not a kid, but I'm still a kid at heart. That was Good. really fascinating and Thank exciting. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. So many of these um, bird-like fossils have come out of China. Yes. But why is, is my question. You mentioned that they have um, a particular sediment that's really good yep. for preserving them. Yep. Is that sediment not found anywhere else? So... It is, it is. And I think the, there's two answers to that question, which is essentially why are we getting so much amazing stuff out of China? Number one is that they really only began looking in detail in the 1990s, whereas we began 200 years ago, and, and you know, Mary Anning, et cetera, et cetera. So we were collecting stuff for so much longer. Um, but, but that still doesn't fully answer it. And, uh, and linked with that would be the fact that China is huge. I mean, a one country the size of Europe. So you're finding the combination of everything from the UK, France, China, uh, France, uh, Germany, Italy, all together in one country. And I don't know why these lake systems are so extensive, because most other sites of exceptional preservation, some people will have heard of um, Solnhof, and that's where Archaeopteryx comes from in Germany, or the Burgess Shale of Canada. They're usually quite restricted areas, uh, and yet the, the, these Chinese ones are thousands of kilometers. So, I actually just don't know why they are so extensive. And it's, that, it's the fact they are very extensive is why we've got thousands of specimens. Thank you. I, see, I can see a hand at, doing a test, test the, uh, the, the right at the back in the, in the second section. I'm saying I don't want to abandon the people who are, who are Oops, yes. right, right, uh, <laughs> right at the rear, give them a chance to ask a question as well. <laughs> get, the, uh, get the assistants running around. Uh, hi. Um, we saw in this presentation some dinosaurs with feathers and pterosaurs. Yes. I was wondering if you'd found any evidence for uh, sea reptiles from that era with feathers, and if not, if you had any ideas why that would be. So the question is about the feathers in dinosaurs and pterosaurs and other reptiles, were you asking yeah, about? Like a, an or or yes. some kind of sea yes. creature? Yes, yes. So. We're not trying to say everything has got feathers. Um, and indeed, yes, there have been some very good studies of ichthyosaur skin um, from uh, Lyme Regis in Dorset. And I'm not sure whether anybody studies skin in the Whitby reptiles. I can't think of examples. No, Whereas at Holzmaden, which is in Germany, it's the same age as the jet rock at Whitby, people have found good skin, I think, good skin outlines. We can say for sure the marine reptiles didn't have feathers, but the skin is preserved and it's been possible to reconstruct that they had quite thick blubbery layers, as you might predict, like a dolphin, and that the blubbery layers give them a bit of warmth. They were warm-blooded in cold oceans. And I think it has some function in um, getting rid of eddies when the thing is swimming, that the skin can adjust and, and sort of get rid of turbulence and enables the, the animal to swim faster than otherwise might be expected. And finally, the ichthyosaurs have melanosomes. They were black all over, which was unusual. So most of the marine reptiles, like whales and dolphins today and sharks and large fish, have this counter shading where there's a pale belly and a dark back. And the reason for that in a fish is so that they, they, they're, they're camouflaged. If you're looking in from above, they'll just look dark like the deep ocean that you're looking down into. 
If you look from below upwards, they look pale like the white sky, and so again, they sort of disappear. So it's unusual that ichthyosaurs turn out to be all black, um, which suggests they live only in very, very deep waters where there's maybe no light. I can see you <laughs> dash down the stairs. So I think we'll make, if we make this the final question, because Mike's going to stick around for book signing if you want to come and have a, have a chat. But yes, we've got a, a question down here. Let's, let's get one final point the put on the yes. spot. Are dinosaurs cold-blooded or warm-blooded? That's a great question to finish with, actually. Thank you for asking. Beautiful. Were the dinosaurs cold-blooded or warm-blooded? And the answer is, they were warm-blooded. And I think that's now pretty much agreed. When I started, there was a big fuss about this, and an American called Bob Backer, who himself wrote books about it, he had suggested they were warm-blooded, but we paleontologists, including myself, said, no, 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 don't be ridiculous. They're reptiles, they're cold-blooded. In fact, all the evidence of the structure of their bone shows that they were warm-blooded, and their posture, because they stand upright like birds and uh, uh, mammals and so on. They don't have the sort of sprawling limbs of lizards. And importantly, now, we're pretty clear they did all have feathers, or, or at least the smaller ones. So if they've all got a covering of feathers, that would go with warm-bloodedness as well. So it's, it, it's, it's a, a very it, it, big turnaround. There, it's even been recently published. There was a recent geochemical study also finding waste materials of the the, the heat production within the bones of the dinosaurs. That was published quite recently. So it's all sort of adding up and combining with this evidence that birds evolved over a long span of time and all sorts of other stuff. So that has been another quiet revolution going on as well. Thank you. Well, thank you all for your, uh, for coming. Thank you all for your questions. I say Mike's going to stick around to, uh, to, sign some books if you want to come down and, and do that. Um, from a personal point, just to say, obviously if you haven't been to see Yorkshire's Jurassic World here in the museum, you should go and have a look at that, and you'll see that Yorkshire's dinosaurs are almost entirely footprints, which is a very interesting, uh, interesting you know, problem in itself, which we have been looking at. Uh, in September, with the Yorkshire Fossil Festival in Scarborough, if you want to come on a footprint hunt, uh, you, we'll be running those. You can come along, uh, and uh, I have got some flyers with me if you want to have a look at that. But in the meantime, uh, just thank Mike again, and... Uh, Come on, come on with the book.